Did Israel agree to capitulate in this war? On Friday, President Biden said we have. I'll give you all the details and the play-by-play -play coming up at In Focus. Hi, welcome to another In Focus. On Friday, after Shabbat came in in Israel, very conveniently, President Biden gave a statement on ending the war in the Middle East. And I say it was very convenient that he began it after Shabbat because it was actually really just after the Sabbath came in in Israel and the Israeli government keeps Shabbat, which means that to all intents and purposes, the Israeli government was silenced from about, I think, around an hour before Biden began to speak until you know, 24 hours after he was done. That's that's a pretty nice way to give a speech about Israel when the Israeli government has no ability to react, or at least not in a serious way. So that was already, the minute that he said that he was going to be doing this, it was already fairly clear that he was about to do something that wasn't going to be great for Israel. And then it only got worse from there. So I, I view this as a dirty trick, but I haven't even gotten started. So I, what I think that the best thing to do is to go through the speech sort of in a play-by-play, -play, and uh, I can explain to you what he's doing throughout so that you can understand uh, what it is that we're dealing with here. First of all, what Biden essentially said, or what he said, the purpose of his speech was to present what he claimed was an Israeli proposal for a hostage deal with Hamas that was going to lead to a cessation of the war, an end to the war. And he presented the plan as an Israeli proposal. And just if we want to summarize really quickly at the beginning, uh, how this worked. So for well, for about the first two minutes, he spoke snidely about uh, former President uh, Donald Trump's uh, conviction in the New York uh, state court for whatever it was that he was convicted for. And, um, and then after he did that, he moved to the subject at hand, which was Israel and Hamas and how the United States was overseeing a ceasefire that was going to be permanent. Um, and he and what he did was he spent about four minutes of his speech giving the details of the proposal, which he claimed was Israeli. And then he spent twice that amount of time, eight minutes, uh, demanding that Israel accept its proposal, which Israel supposedly made. So just to give you that, that's kind of, you know, like a very quick overview of what he did. So he spent a third of the time talking about the details that he provided about the proposal that he claimed was Israeli, and then uh, and then in, uh, the next two-thirds of the speech, hectoring Israel to accept its own proposal. So let's just go through it. My negotiators of foreign policy, intelligence community, and like have been relentlessly focused, not just on a ceasefire that would, ever, that would inevitably be fragile and temporary, but on a durable end of the war. That's been the focus, a durable end of this war. One that brings all the hostages home, ensures Israel's security, creates a better day after in Gaza without Hamas in power, and sets the stage for a political settlement that provides a better future for Israelis and Palestinians alike. Okay, so what do we see here? Uh, Biden talked about a durable ceasefire. And a durable ceasefire he characterized in a certain way. And the way that he characterized it was in accordance with what he views as the U.S. goals, what he set as the U.S. goals in this war. Um, and this is what he said. He said, one that brings all the hostages home, ensures Israel's security, creates a better day after in Gaza without Hamas in power and sets the stage for a political settlement that provides a better future for Israelis and Palestinians alike. So a couple of things about this uh, set of goals that he set forth uh, as the American goals um, for the war. These are not Israel's goals. And in many ways, they're completely contradictory to Israel's goals. So there is one goal that both Israel and the United States share, uh, at least on a declarative level, which is to bring all of the hostages home. But Israel has two other goals, and those goals are the eradication, the destruction of Hamas's military and political power. So ending Hamas's regime and ending Hamas's ability to ever um, fight again as a military organization. And then the third goal of the war 
is to prevent Gaza from ever reemerging as a threat to Israel, the kind uh, that it was on October 6th, so, or at all, in fact. And so those are Israel's three goals. But what does Biden say here? He says, ensures Israel's security. That's an amorphous claim, and that's very subjective. What ensures Israel's security? Well, Israel on the 6th of October thought that the technological obstacles that we had along the border with Gaza and the fence and everything like that, the security fence or the security wall, that those were the things that were going to protect us. And it worked out that that completely didn't work. Nothing worked. And so the only way that we can protect ourselves from Hamas is to actually, you know, destroy Hamas. Um, to create a better day after in Gaza without Hamas in power. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, but that's not Israel's goal in the war. The goal in the war is to secure Israel's uh, safety and security and survival. Over the long term, when we've seen not only that Hamas really means it when they say that they want to annihilate all the Jews, but that they've actually brought the people of Gaza along with them, which is why there were more innocent civilians, uninvolved civilians, civilians, who entered Israel after Hamas. Hamas brought in, I think, about 3,000 terrorists invaded Israel, and then 5,000 civilians from Gaza came in, and actually they carried out the brunt of the atrocities, the brunt of the rapes, the brunt of the slaughters, the brunt of the, uh, the, of this, of the sadism, burning people alive. And in fact, some of the uh, uh, testimony of the survivors were saying that the people who were torching the homes to burn the Jews who were inside of them alive were children, that they were given the honors, like how nice, you know, here, give your 12-year-old kid a torch and let him uh, burn a Jewish family alive, and that, and that that happened as well. So when Israel looks at the goal of the war, it's not to make sure that everybody in Gaza is happy, it's to make sure that nobody in Gaza can hurt Israel. So that's a very different goal, um, and sets a stage for a political settlement that provides a better future for Israelis and Palestinians alike. Well, that sounds like a peace process, and definitely Israelis aren't interested in that. More on that later. Again, our goals in Israel are to defeat Hamas militarily and to destroy it as a political regime, to bring back all of the hostages, and to prevent Gaza from ever posing a threat to Israel in the future. So uh, from the outset, he's placing the United States in opposition to Israel in terms of what the ends of the war are. They're not the same. Now he goes into the ceasefire deal. What are the contours of the ceasefire deal? So just, just give a lesson to it. Now, after intensive diplomacy carried out by my team, my many conversations with leaders of Israel, Qatar, and Egypt, and other Middle Eastern countries, Israel has now offered, Israel has offered, a comprehensive new proposal. It's a roadmap to an enduring ceasefire and the release of all hostages. Okay, having stipulated that it's an Israeli proposal, he goes on to explain what Israel is proposing. This new proposal has three phases, three. The first phase would last for six weeks. Here's what it would include. A full and complete ceasefire. A withdrawal of Israeli forces from all populated areas of Gaza. Release of a number of hostages, including women, the elderly, the wounded, in exchange for release of hundreds of Palestinian prisoners. Additional some remains of hostages who have been killed would be returned to their families, bringing some degree of closure to that terrible grief. Palestinians, civilians, would return to their homes and neighborhoods in all areas of Gaza, including in the north. Humanitarian assistance would surge with 600 trucks carrying aid into Gaza every single day. During the six weeks of, of phase one, Israel and Hamas would negotiate the necessary arrangements to get to phase two, which is a permanent end to hostilities. Then phase two would be an exchange for the release of all remaining living hostages, including male soldiers, Israeli forces would withdraw from Gaza, and as long as Hamas lives up to its commitments, a temporary ceasefire would become, in the words of the, proposed, the Israeli proposal, the cessation of hostilities permanently, end of quote. Cessation of hostilities permanently. Finally, in phase three, a major reconstruction plan for, Ga for Gaza would, would commence, and any final remains of hostages who have been killed would be returned to their families. That's the offer that's now on the table. So that's quite the offer, right? I mean, that 
the, what we hear when we hear the nuts and bolts of it, and and I have more details of the of the deal as published by uh, the Hamas aligned uh, paper called Al Majala. Um, they're talking about you know, mass murderers. They're talking about people who are serving life in prison because they k killed people uh, getting out of uh, prison. One one version of it has all of the terrorists who carried out the slaughter of October 7th being allowed out of prison here as well. So um, that's one aspect of it. They say that uh, in the first, um, when they're dealing with the civilians and the humanitarian proposal that you'll have 30 terrorists that come out for every hostage, um, for every girl uh, soldier that comes out, you'll have 50 terrorists who are in Israeli prisons let out of prison, and among those 50 per uh, female soldier, 30 of them will be serving life in prison. So every female hostage, female soldier hostage, and we saw the video of them being taken and uh, and being told that they were going to be used as sex slaves. So these girls, these innocent girls, these soldiers, these non-combatant soldiers who have been hostage for nearly 300 days in Gaza, in order to bring them home, Israel is supposed to release 50 terrorists per female uh, soldier hostage, 30 of whom will be murderers, okay? So th th those are just some of the contours of the deals. Um, Israel has to redeploy out of all of the hot areas of Gaza, give up all of the uh, all of the sort of um, um, positions that we've constructed in Gaza, like the Netzarim corridor that cuts Gaza in half from east to west down the middle, um, and all of that. So those are things that Israel is supposed to give up. Uh, in order to get back about 30, 33 hostages, um, and we don't know how many of them are even alive. So that's that's what the deal is that Israel allegedly proposed. Uh, and believe it or not, uh, both Hezbollah and uh, and Hamas media are jubilant about this uh, uh, Israeli proposal. So that's one thing um, that that we have to talk about, and and then we have to realize that. At the end of the day, this isn't a hostage deal at all. This is a this is a deal for Israeli surrender to Hamas, where the hostages are being used as currency in order to force Israel to capitulate to Hamas. That's basically what's going on here, because Israel has to give up all of its positions. It has to stop its major military operations. Oh, and I wanted to say another thing, which is that uh, today, Sunday, it was reported that in order not to get uh, get Biden angry, Israel has curtailed it, scaled back its operation in Rafah. It was supposed to be going in with two divisions, and it scaled it back. We were supposed to take over the entire border zone, and we've left two kilometers open, which means that we're not in charge of the international border, and all of this is in order not to anger the Americans. So this is really interesting. They have totally different war aims than Israel does, and so this is a capitulation. How else do we know? Because when we listen to the terms of Israel's, supposedly Israel's proposal, there's nothing there about Hamas giving up power. Nothing there at all about Hamas giving up power. Um, and and then it's not just that. Um, I want you to hear another part. This comes later in the in the uh, in the speech. It comes actually around uh, 10 minutes and 29 seconds when he talks about. Um, how we're going to make sure that the negotiations continue on past the six weeks, even when Hamas isn't releasing uh, isn't releasing hostages, uh, in order to get to phase two. So he starts off very nicely, saying that Israel always has the right to defend itself. But but listen to the fine print that he gives at the end. Israel will always have the right to defend itself against the threats to its security, and to bring those responsible October seventh to justice. And the United States will always ensure that Israel has what it needs to defend itself. If Hamas fails to fulfill its commitments under the deal, Israel can resume military operations. But Egypt and Qatar have assured me, and they are continuing to work to ensure that Hamas doesn't do that. And the United States will help ensure that Israel lives up to their obligations as well. That's what this deal says. That's what it says. Okay, so what did the president just say here? I mean, this is key. This is really important stuff. That's why I, I want to stop on it for a second. He said 
that Israel has the right to defend itself. If Israel decides that Hamas is not abiding by the terms of the ceasefire deal, then it can go back and reinstate its hostilities. But, but on the other hand, Egypt and Qatar are going to oversee Hamas's compliance with the ceasefire deal. And America, the United States, is going to oversee Israel's compliance with the agreement. Okay, so he's doing uh, two important things here. First of all, we have to remember what we've learned since the beginning of this war. We've learned that Qatar and Hamas, I mean, we sort of knew this already, are basically the same entity, right? Hamas says leadership is living and yucking it up in five-star hotels in Doha, in the capital of Qatar. Um, they are completely conjoined in terms of media messaging. Al Jazeera, which is uh, controlled by the Qatari regime, is just a mouthpiece for Hamas. Um, it is a terrorist satellite network. It was finally stopped from broadcasting in, uh, from Israel because it was providing intelligence information to Hamas through its broadcasts. Okay, so Qatar is Hamas. There's no dis there's no real distinction between the two. So Hamas is going to make sure that Hamas abides by its agreement. And who else is going to ensure that Hamas abides by its agreement? Egypt. And what have we discovered since the beginning of this war? And I wrote about it, I think, two weeks ago in JNS, and you should look it up. Egypt is also, if not Hamas, it is a full partner of Hamas. Hamas was able to build up its military infrastructure and capabilities and Gaza because Egypt was a full partner in enabling it. We've gotten, since Israel started its operation in Rafah, Israeli forces have uncovered 20 tunnels that traverse the Egyptian uh, Gaza border. Some of them are large enough to move vehicles through. And essentially, H Hamas and Egypt jointly oversaw the international border in a way that enabled Hamas to bring in whatever material it wanted, whatever personnel it wanted to ferry between the two between the two territories. It was able to do it well. And how come it was able to do this? Because the Egyptian side of the border was controlled by uh, a consortium called Al Organi, which is the name of a Bedouin tribal chief in the northern Sinai, whose business partner is none other than one General Mahmoud al-Sisi. That's right, the president of, of Egypt's son, okay? He's the deputy head of the General Intelligence Service of the Egyptian military. They control all of the operations along the border with Gaza. And he was a silent partner in the al Organi group that oversaw the entire Egyptian side of the border. So all the earthworks, all the tunneling, and all of the operation of the international terminal above ground that had was in charge of all the formal transit between Gaza and Egypt was also under the control of Sisi's son through the Al-Organi group. Okay, so Egypt is a full partner with Hamas. Qatar is Hamas. These two organizations, these two entities, these two governments are the guarantors that Hamas is abiding by its side of the deal, which means Hamas is the cat is is watching the cream, right? I mean, it's all Hamas. It's all one alliance that is going on here against Israel to protect Hamas and its regime in Gaza from destruction. And the United States is guaranteeing that Israel is going to abide by its agreement. And here we see that from the outset of the war, whereas Qatar and Egypt have been total propagandists for Hamas, since the outset of the war, the United States has been either passive aggressive towards Israel or just aggressive towards Israel as Biden was on Friday when he gave the speech during Shabbat in Israel, right? So so, so first of all, the first point I wanted to make was that, you know, the people who are guaranteeing or the forces that are guaranteeing, the governments that are guaranteeing Hamas abides by its commitments to the, to the deal are Hamas allies or Hamas's state sponsor or whatever. And then... And then the second point that I wanted to make is that by saying that these two governments on the one hand are going to oversee Hamas keeping the ceasefire and the United States is going to guarantee that Israel abides by its side of the deal, here is Biden drawing a moral and legal equivalence between Israel, America's chief ally in the Middle East, which is a liberal democracy, and Hamas, a genocidal terrorist organization, which is engaged in a war of genocide against the Jewish state and the Jewish people. 
Okay, but but on the one hand, you have the Americans making sure Israel keeps its side of the bargain, and on the other hand, you have Qatar and Egypt taking care of Hamas. So there are equal sides to the equation, right? And what he also says is that Israel's right to self-defense is mitigated, is limited, is essentially abrogated because there are three outside forces who are all, uh, to one degree or another, hostile to Israel and supportive of Hamas that are overseeing Hamas's compliance with the deal and Israel. So if Israel says Hamas isn't keeping its side of the agreement, well, you have you have Egypt and Qatar saying, no, 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 that's not true. And then you have the Americans and saying, listen, you're wrong, Israel. Don't second guess us or we'll say that you're not keeping your side of the agreement and we'll open you up to sanctions at the UN Security Council over which we won't, you know, we won't use our veto. Okay, so the United States has constantly got the ability to threaten Israel, and and Hamas is protected by its two state sponsors and indirectly by the United States, which provides it with equal, if not greater, legitimacy than it grants Israel, because at least Hamas has these allies that are protecting it, and Israel has the United States, which is denying it its right to defend itself. So that's, I think, a very key thing. <clears throat> now let's just go back a little bit. So he's given this proposal. He claims that it's Israel that made this proposal. The people of Israel should know they can make this offer without any further risk to their own security because they've devastated Hamas forces over the past eight months. At this point, Hamas no longer is capable of carrying out another October 7th. It's one of the Israelis' main objectives in this war, and quite frankly, a righteous one. Okay, so what's he saying here? <laughs> He's saying, ah, oh, no Israelis who were slaughtered, 1,200 of you, no families of over 600 Israeli soldiers who have given their lives in this battle. No, you don't have anything to worry about. Why? Because you've already devastated Hamas. Hamas is done for. It can't carry out another October 7th attack against you. Look, job well done. Declare victory. You've won, Right. So there are a lot of problems with this. I would say the first problem with that is just sort of like a tonal thing. It's totally patronizing. You have a society that's completely mobilized to win this war, and he's patting us on the back like we're a child, right? Not that not that our sons have been fighting in Gaza since October, right? No, 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 no. Not not that not that we've we've been uh, anguished over the the plight of the hostages since October seventh. No. No, job well done. Good, 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 good. You won. You devastated. And then the second problem, the second problem is, um, <laughs> what does he mean uh, Hamas can't carry out another October 7th? Well, on October 6th, we never thought that Hamas could carry out another October 7th, right? But like, uh, maybe, maybe it can, maybe it can't. And aside from that, that's not the goal of the war. I mean, that sets the bar extremely low. So what you're saying is that the goal of your war is not to wipe Hamas off uh, the face of the earth, not to destroy its military capabilities, not to destroy its regime. It's just to make sure that this group of sadistic rapists and murderers and baby killers uh, can't do that as easily, right? That's the bar. So like, if they can kill 100 Israelis, that's okay if they can kill... 1,100 Israelis, that's fine too. They can't kill 11, they can't kill 1,200. Is that what he's saying? I mean, October 7th was supposed to be, you know, a, an event that could never happen again. And and it's Israel's job to ensure that that's the case. But that's not all the job of the IDF here is. is. That's, that's not their only task. I mean, that's a minimum that everybody just sort of takes for granted. Of course, they're not going to be able to do that again. The point is to annihilate them because what we learned on October 7th is that the minute that you give them any power whatsoever, they'll expand it exponentially until they have the power to do what they did on October 7th. You can't trust these people. They say, trust me. Oh, you've won. Good Jews. Good, good, good for you. No, no, no. No, that's totally unacceptable. And it's actually it's actually shocking that somebody would dare say something like that. And that, didn't you love the way that he said it was a righteous goal? I mean, no. Anyway... So that that was uh, that was the first thing that he says. And then we're going to go to the second things that he says. I know there are those in Israel who will not agree with this plan and will call for the war to continue indefinitely. Some 
some are even in the government coalition. And they've made it clear they want to occupy Gaza, they want to keep fighting for years, and the hostages are not a priority to them. Well, I've urged the leadership in Israel to stand behind this deal, despite whatever pressure comes. All right, so here he is. He's talking about, you know, um, okay, so who is opposed to this deal? Well, the people who are opposed to this deal are people who don't care about the hostages, right? They don't care about the hostages. The people who oppose this deal don't care about the hostages. That's just low, right? I mean, we had Tzvika Moore, the father of Eitan Moore, who's being held hostage in Gaza on this show, and he is one of the founders of the Hope Forum of Hostages Families. And by the way, there are more members in the Hope Forum than there are in the Hostages Families Forum that, you know, has all of these extremely well-financed daily demonstrations in Tel Aviv, okay? And they say no deal like that. The only thing that we want is a deal that brings all of the hostages home, and we think that the only deal that will bring all of the hostages home is Israeli victory. They also make clear, rightly, that if you surrender to Hamas in order to secure the freedom of the hostages from October 7th, you are guaranteeing that next time around, and it will come very quickly, not slowly, we won't have 250 hostages, we'll have 2,500 hostages. Okay, I mean, Hezbollah, if they overran northern Israel tomorrow, they could take the entire city of Nauria hostage, essentially, right? So what are we talking about here? If, if you capitulate to Hamas in order to secure uh, some or even all of the hostages' freedom, you're making 9 million Israelis hostage to a future deal, okay? But he's saying that nobody who opposes capitulation cares about the hostages. Okay, that, that's, that's the first thing that he says. The second thing that he says is, and there really, it, it, there's, there aren't that many Israelis who feel that way. He says there are, there are a couple of people in the Israeli government who may feel that way. That's what he says. And of course he's talking, he always talks about Smotrich and Ben Gvir, Minister of Finance and Minister of Public Security, because they oppose capitulating to Hamas. But what he fails to note is that survey after survey after survey of Israeli public opinion show that 70% of the overall population of Israel, okay, opposes capitulation to Hamas and demands what he refers to as an empty shell of a word, total victory in this war. Okay, so he's not putting down just a couple of people, you know, who don't matter for anything. He also course, ignores the fact, right, that Ben Gvir and Smotrich together have more support in the public than Benny Gantz and Gadi Eisenkot do, right? He is ignoring both the fact that they themselves were directly elected by the, by, the, by the people of Israel in the Knesset vote in November 2022. He's also ignoring the fact that the overwhelming majority of Israelis across the political spectrum share their goal of continuing on to fight to victory. And I think I think that that I think that that is a very, very key understanding. He's, he's referring to the vast majority of Israelis as a small minority, and he's derogating that minority. So those are the two things that I wanted to say about that. And now that he's demonized the public, he threatens us with international isolation and all kinds of other terrible things that will happen if we don't accept what he claims is our own proposal. Now, we'll get to that in a second. Don't worry. But here, let's just see what he says will happen to Israel. It's sort of like, you know, one of those chain letters, right? Uh, the last person that didn't forward this letter, you know, he died of plague, right? And so did his entire village. So that's basically what he does here. Let's just watch that. He starts the direct threats against us. And to the people of Israel, let me say this. As someone who's had a lifelong commitment to Israel, as the only American president who's ever gone to Israel in a time of war, as someone who just sent the U.S. forces to directly defend Israel when it was attacked by Iran, I ask you to take a step back 
I think what will happen if this moment is lost. We can't lose this moment. Indefinite war in pursuit of an unidentified notion of total victory will not bring Israel and will not bring down, bog down, will only bog down Israel and Gaza, draining the economic, military, and human, and human resources, and furthering Israel's isolation in the world. So he says that he's the greatest defender Israel has ever had, right? He just sent U.S. forces to directly protect Israel. So first of all, I'm not minimizing the importance of what happened with CENTCOM, that they did intercept a lot of ballistic missiles. But I do want to say here um, that they intercepted no drones, right? No, sorry, they intercepted cruise missiles. They did not intercept ballistic missiles or almost no ballistic missiles, which are very difficult. Almost all of the ballistic missiles that were intercepted were intercepted by Israel. And they also, and, and so what they were able to intercept were the slow moving targets. And Israel could have done that too. All right. So it was very important. It was very wonderful that America helped Israel on the night of April 13th, 14th, when we were attacked by Iran. But we have to keep things in proportions, all right? Most of the work, the vast majority of the work and the most difficult tasks were undertaken by Israel and the U.S. failed in those operations. So I think that's very important to point out. But beyond that, of course, what is he saying here? He's saying, I ask you to take a step back and think what will happen if this moment is lost, right? Indefinite war in pursuit of an unidentified notion of total victory will not bring Israel, will not bring, will not bring Israel in, will not bring down, will bog down, will only bog down Israel and Gaza, draining the economic, military, and human resources and further isolate, furthering Israel's isolation in the world. And that will not bring the hostages home, that will not bring an enduring defeat of Hamas that will not bring Israel's last Israel lasting security. So let's just think about this for a second, right? He is saying total victory is an unidentified notion. So no, it's not. It's actually a very clearly defined notion, which means destroy Hamas's military capability and its capability to exert regime power in Gaza, right? And that's the problem with this so-called Israeli proposal that Biden set out after Shabbat began in Israel so that the Israeli government couldn't respond, okay? Because there is nothing amorphous about what total victory means from an Israeli perspective. Now, the problem for the United States is that in order to achieve total victory, right, that it's going to drain the economic, military, human resources and furthering Israel's isolation. Let's talk about the isolation Afterwards, do you know how much war this war has cost Israel so far? It's cost Israel 250 million shekels, and we haven't even started the north. So we're looking at a situation where the price tag ultimately for this war could land us at around a trillion shekels. So that mortgages off the the future not only economically of of our children and our grandchildren, but of our great grandchildren. What are you going to do? Freedom isn't free, and we're fighting for our survival. And 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 the amount of money and troops that Israel would have to expend in order to maintain military control over Gaza and even a military government in Gaza for the next decade or two is a fraction of this cost. Okay, so let's not talk about costs because the costs are much lower for keeping the threat to a minimum in Gaza or eliminating it altogether before they're allowed to rebuild then having to go in after they built this monster machine, thanks to the United States and Egypt and all of the donor countries that care so much about Gaza's rehabilitation. All right, so let's just be very clear. The costs for Israel are much lower if we control Gaza for the long term than it is if we allow Hamas or its sister terrorist organizations in the Palestinian Authority and Islamic Jihad and whatever successor, Al-Qaeda in Gaza, come up right, in, in the aftermath of this war. And they will, because there's no other constituency in Gaza other than jihadists, right? That's just the way it is. And the only way to get there is if Israel controls Gaza, uh, if, if not in perpetuity, then for a very long time, okay? And it's much less expensive. So first of all, that's just false, what he said. And then it goes to that question of isolation. I'm sorry, President Biden, I really thank you for providing direct military assistance to Israel and aid and all of the rest of it. 
But who is isolating Israel? Who who abstained from a UN Security Council resolution for a ceasefire? Right? Why is it that the ICC prosecutors' charge sheet against our elected leaders um, reads like a State Department communique about the humanitarian disaster in Gaza where people are starving, or something that Samantha Power said, right? A uh, uh, an avoidable famine in northern Gaza, which is untrue. There is no famine. There is no starvation. And what about the number of civilians being killed? The fact that the ratio of terrorists to civilians is 1 to 1.3, the lowest in recorded history of, mil of, of urban operations, that makes no difference because you say that too many civilians have been killed. And what did the ICC do? They accused us of wantonly murdering civilians. So it's all kind of aligned. But you're talking about Israel's international isolation. While propounding these blood libels against Israel that then are picked up by International Criminal Court and by the EU and by the UN Security Council. So who is responsible for Israel's isolation? Is it things that Israel has done? Yeah, only if you think that Israel defending itself from a genocidal terrorist organization actually you know, justifiably opens it up to international isolation, which apparently the Biden administration does because that's their policy. But wait, let's just get back to the Israeli proposal, right? All right, so then let's just go to what he says about um, Lebanon. I think that we should go to there because the really good news, he says, is that all of Israel's problems are going to go away as soon as we capitulate and we don't destroy Hamas's regime. That was the other thing I had to mention. There's nothing in here about destroying Hamas's regime. There's nothing in here about annihilating Hamas. He pays lip service to it. He says about he gives a clause at the end about Hamas can't come to power again. Whatever. I mean, he never took him out of power, so... I don't even know what that means, but let's just go to Lebanon. And once a ceasefire and hostage deal is concluded, it unlocks the possibility of a great deal more progress, including, including calm along Israel's northern border with Lebanon. The United States will help forge a diplomatic resolution, one that ensures Israel's security and allows people to safely return to their homes without fear of being attacked. So don't win, right? But you get a comprehensive deal here. And a comprehensive deal here, right, it's going to unlock the possibility of a great deal more progress, including calm along Israel's northern border with Lebanon. The United States will help forge a diplomatic resolution, one that ensures Israel's security and allows people to safely return to their homes without fear of being attacked. So let's just put this into context of Hezbollah, which is Iran's Lebanese foreign legion, all right? And what has Hassan Nasrallah, Hezbollah's head, been doing since Friday when Biden gave this speech giving Israel's proposed ceasefire during Shabbat? He has been celebrating, right? The Hezbollah newspapers have said, oh, let Israel declare victory, but victory is ours. And that's what Hezbollah's newspaper said on Saturday morning. And they're making fun of Israel. And more importantly than the fact that they view what Biden did as forcing Israel to capitulate, they've been escalating their attacks against Israel. The poor people of northern Israel. Here, let's look at these children in northern Israel, what they had to endure this morning, Sunday, when they were on their way to school. <laughs> Okay, these are children from communities in the Western Galilee that haven't been evacuated by the IDF. They have been under around the clock attack over the past three days, all right, since since Biden gave his speech, or two days after since Biden gave his speech. So Hezbollah has responded to Biden's speech, where he says that the United States is going to reach a diplomatic uh, a deal with Hezbollah that's going to allow the Israelis to go home by massively escalating his rocket and missile assaults against northern Israel, terrifying, terrorizing Israeli families, Israeli children, and, you know, the, the mayor or the head of the local council of Margaliot, he said, Margaliot 
is completely under Hezbollah occupation. That doesn't mean that there are Hezbollah forces on the ground. What it means is that you can't poke your head out of the front door without them ha seeing you and having total control over whether you live or die. That is an occupation, okay? And so at present, that's the situation in northern, God in northern uh, Israel. And what Biden is proposing is a diplomatic solution where Hezbollah is going to be trusted to move its forces 10 kilometers away from the uh, of, of the border with Israel. Now, who's going to ensure that that happens? Good question. Oh, I bet it will be the Egyptians and maybe the Qataris, right? They're going to do it. And the Americans, in the meantime, will guarantee that Israel doesn't take any action in its own defense against Hezbollah, which is still along the border, protected by Qatar and Egypt or whoever else comes in. So this is all a lie. This is saying northern Israel is going to remain effectively occupied by Hezbollah and that the civilians will never be able to go back to their homes. That's what Biden's deal is saying. And it's not just over there, right? So, right. Then they start saying, uh, let's forget, uh, we can talk about the Palestinians too. Should we talk about how wonderful it's all going to be for them? Well, why not? Here, let's just see, where are we? Ah, yes. We have, first of all, regional integration, including normalization with Saudi Arabia. Israel could come more deeply integrated in the region, including, it's no surprise to you all, including no uh, p potential historic normalization agreement with Saudi Arabia. Israel could be part of a regional security network to counter the threat posed by Iran. All this progress would make Israel more secure, with Israeli families no longer living in the shadow of a terrorist attack. Right. So we're going to get a normalization agreement with Saudi Arabia and we'll be part of a regional security network to counter the threat posed by Iran. And all of this progress would make Israel more secure with Israeli families no longer living in the shadow of a terrorist attack. Right. So this is pure hogwash, right? Because... If Israel allows Hamas to remain intact, which is what the supposedly Israeli proposal that Biden presented during Shabbat in Israel on Friday uh, mm -hmm. would allow, right, because Hamas never leaves power. Hamas is treated as a co-equal in the, in the hostage negotiations and, in fact, is protected by two state sponsors, whereas Israel is sort of cast asunder by the United States, which won't allow us to renew uh, uh, military operations during at the end of stage one because they get to decide whether we're abiding by the ceasefire, whether Hamas is, et cetera. We no longer have the right under the Israeli proposal to determine that Hamas is breaching the ceasefire deal. Very nice. So, um, and then everybody's going to see that, right? So why on earth would Saudi Arabia ever normalize its relations with Israel? Oh, the answer is it wouldn't because Israel has no value anymore, because Israel isn't an independent state. The international, the regional integration that the United States wants to integrate Israel into would actually lead to the end of Israeli sovereignty, because it would be in a regional framework, and you have the Egyptians and the Qataris and the Saudis and the UAE all underneath the United States, all blocking Israel from defending itself. And watching as Israel, after October 7th, allows Hamas to continue to control Gaza, whether, you know, openly or underneath a Palestinian authority, which is going to be completely subjugated to Hamas and, by the way, shares all of its goals. So this is not, you know, a hostage deal. This is an order to capitulate by the United States against Israel. That's what's happening here. And now just, you know, let's just look for a second at, you know, a better future for the Palestinian people. And all of this would create the conditions for a different future a better future for the Palestinian people, one of self-determination, dignity, security, and freedom. This path is available once the deal is struck. Right, because only 90 percent of Israeli Jews oppose Palestinian statehood, because after October 7th or on October 7th, we saw what that means. Right? We have Palestinian um, forces in Tulkarm that uh, let's just show you a little clip of them. You know, these are these are terrorists having parades with their guns. They're shooting at Israeli communities in the Sharon, not in Judea and Samaria, in the Sharon region, Bat Khefer, in the Gilboa region, right? They're shooting at them around the clock. What are they trying to signal to us? 
that if they get a state, everything's going to be okay? Of course not. They're signaling uh, to us that when they talk about state building, what they're really talking about is state annihilating. Not their state, our state. That's what they did in southern Israel. That's what they would do from from northern to northern Israel under uh, in, uh, in from Lebanon. And that's, of course, what they'll do to central Israel from Judea and Samaria. If the U.S. vision for the day after, including the establishment of a Palestinian state, is implemented. So that's that's so much, you know, about that. And then, you know, just to ensure that we understand what's at stake, at 1338, we have a call for the Israeli people. What are we supposed to do? So let's just watch that. That'll be the final, you know, cherry on top here. But I need your help. Everyone who wants peace now must raise their voices and let the leaders know they should take this deal work to make it real, make it lasting, and forge a better future out of the tragic terror attack and war. It's time to begin this new stage, for the hostages to come home, for Israel to be secure, for the suffering to stop. It's time for this war to end. He wants to level with us, right? He needs our help. He needs our help. And how are we supposed to help him? Everyone who wants peace now must raise their voices and let their leaders know that they should take this deal. So what happened right after Biden makes his speech? Well, all of the people on the left wanted to make their voices heard, and they started demanding that the government accept Israel's proposal. In fact, they call it Netanyahu's proposal. That's what they're calling it, because why not? Biden said it was his. So where does, where, where does the prime minister of Israel stand on this? So... Uh, despite the fact that it was Shabbat, the prime minister's office put out uh, two statements. They put out one on Friday night and the next one on Saturday. So this is what they said. The first one on May 31st says, uh, the government of Israel is united in its desire to return the hostages as soon as possible and is working to achieve this goal. The prime minister authorized the negotiating team to present a proposal to that end, which would also enable Israel to continue the war until all its objectives are achieved, including the destruction of Hamas's military and governing capabilities. And then here's the kicker. The actual proposal put forward by Israel, including the conditional transition from one phase to the next, allows Israel to uphold these principles. So what they're saying is that what Biden presented as Israel's proposal was not the actual proposal. The actual proposal kept the power to reinstate hostilities in Israel's hands, not in some consortium of state sponsors of Hamas on the one hand, and of course, Israel's state sponsor, America, the great Biden administration, on the other hand. And then on June 1st, the Biden, the, after, you know, all of the reports were continuing to go on, uh, the prime minister's office put out a second uh, statement, and it says this. Israel's conditions for ending the war have not changed. The destruction of Hamas's military and governing capabilities, the freeing of all hostages, and ensuring that Gaza no longer poses a threat to Israel— under the proposal, Israel will continue to insist these conditions are met before a permanent ceasefire is put in place. The notion that Israel will agree to a permanent ceasefire before these conditions are fulfilled is a non-starter. In other words, again, the prime minister's office says that Biden's proposal is not Israel's proposal. Right, we're, we're at a very dangerous moment, right? I already said at the outset that Israel has sort of suspended our operations in Rafa, or we've scaled them back and we haven't taken the entire borders on the so-called uh, Philadelphia corridor. We haven't, there are two, two kilometers of that zone that are still controlled by Hamas Egypt, right? Which is bad, right? So what's the point of sending all of our men into battle if you're not gonna let them fight to victory, right? That, that's a problem in and of itself of a different kind. But we're doing this because the United States is presenting what is essentially Hamas's position from two weeks ago as Israel's position. It did it at an hour that Israel couldn't respond. It presented it as a fait accompli, right? And it's not Israel's position because it's calling for Israel to capitulate to all of Hamas's demands. It's providing Hamas with a 
with the protection of two state sponsors that the United States values and upholds as fairer than the state of Israel, which the United States says it's going to make sure that Israel's honest in its upholding of the ceasefire deal. Now, Hamas put on the table, not Israel. And, and if Israel says anything, right, then, then the prime minister is going to be vilified. I don't know if you guys saw, but the person who came out, I think, first applauding Biden for his, his speech was none other than former President Barack Obama. Why is Obama suddenly in charge? Well, we can only imagine. But what we're seeing here is that the Biden administration played an incredibly dirty trick on Israel, an incredibly sick, dirty trick on Israel, where they presented, the president of the United States presented as Israel's positions, positions that are antithetical to Israel's positions, then said, deal with it. And he called for the opposition, the very small opposition, the less than 30% of Israelis who want Hamas to remain in power in Gaza, to take to the streets and demand that the government accept this proposal that he just presented it as Israel's proposal. This is, this is dangerous territory that we're in right now. And I'm not sure how we navigate this exactly. And I had wanted, I think Netanyahu has to give a primetime you know, press conference to the people. But I don't know, say he does and he tells the truth, then where are we? Right. I mean, it, it, the, the Biden administration has Israel boxed in. And this is a very big problem. There are other problems. Maybe I'll talk about them later in the week about where the army stands on all of this. There was a report that came out on Israel's Channel 11 that it that the entire military uh, security uh, leadership demanded that as stood as one in the security cabinet with Eisenkot and Gantz and Galanz and the chief of staff of the IDF, and the head of the Shin Bet, and the head of operations, and the head of Southern Command, and everybody else who's involved. And they all stood as one man against Netanyahu and said, you have to sign on the dotted line of this proposal. So I don't know what's going on with that. But I do know that what Biden did was deeply dishonest and incredibly hostile. And here we are, fighting a war for a national survival. Biden pays lip service to that battle while seeking in the most obscene way to undermine it and to hand victory to Hamas. And uh, so that's where we are today. And I guess we just have to pray that he doesn't succeed, that you know Hamas rejects the proposal, whatever. The coming days, we'll see where we're going on that. And uh, we'll revisit it uh, later on this week, along with other information. We'll have some great guests as well. So take care and have a good uh, rest of your day. And I don't know, have a nice cup of tea. <laughs> take care. Bye-bye.